everyone, and welcome to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and welcome to the show where we dig deeper to understand what really matters most in business. Coming to you live from the RVN Television Studios, and today I'm pleased to welcome a guest who's uh, zooming in from the other side of the world. Please welcome from Australia, Mark Ashby, founder of Mark Ashby Consulting. Hey, Mark, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Thanks, Dave. It's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight. Yeah, it's great to have you here, all the way from Australia. Uh, I wanted to, um, to start off the program to set the stage here. I mean, our conversation today is going to be primarily focused around the concepts of leadership uh, and what constitutes good leadership and you know, tips and tricks for folks to become better leaders. But I want to start by framing the conversation with uh, an introduction of you and, and your background, because it starts with your experience in the military. Yeah, that's right. I've probably taken a little bit more of an un unconventional path to, to where I'm at with my leadership uh, role now in my business. So that's right, I'm, I'm originally from the military. Um, I was in a, uh, like a specialist unit in the Australian Army, uh, uh, an airborne unit. And uh, I ended up then deploying to the Middle East as a private contractor, where I did many, many years uh, working uh, with and alongside um, your US uh, other specialist units over there. Um, even attached the Green Berets over there for a couple of a couple of uh, years, uh, doing some amazing work over there. Ended up doing a few years at the Australian Embassy, looking after our ambassador and, and sort of visiting politicians and uh, as such there. And I ended up coming back to Australia about 2016 after 11 years in Iraq. I think something like 1,600 missions, which was a a, a pretty <laughs> a pretty incredible time. And I uh, went off to university at, at 48 years of age to do my master's degree and, and then started my own my own sort of uh, consulting uh, leadership sort of uh, crisis awareness culture business, which I've been doing ever since, which I absolutely love. Yeah, and thanks for sharing that with us. And again, thanks for your service, too. Uh, in, in having um, folks from the military on the program in the past, it's always fascinating to me because you know, us, us business people, a lot of times in our day to day, we, we face circumstances and it feels like, oh my God, this is a life and death situation, uh, but far from it. And what, you're, what you've dealt with and what your colleagues have is, is really life and death. So always eager to get perspective and let, let's jump in and let's talk about the, the meaning of leadership. And I think in, in your world right now, your mind, there's a new meaning for leadership. Yeah, look, I, I think for myself, in regards to leadership, I think in this day and age, there's so many different facets and so many different faces with leadership. I think we've become very, very, you know, complex with it. And I, even myself, I find a lot of the, the diagrams I see now, and um, they're becoming so, like I said, so complex. And I find that the when I've worked at that real elite level of leadership, those real high performers, um, and you're talking about uh, generals and you know very, very high level politicians, I find they actually they make it simpler. Um, it's like the higher in the leadership scope I get, that the actual simpler that they actually make it. They tend to, because everybody's got to be on board, everyone's got to understand what's going on. And I think that's the most uh, effective way, in, in my opinion anyway, of, of how leadership works is, you know, you've got to have your people understanding what they're actually doing, or the, the path they're following. And if you make it too complex, um, you know, it gets too confusing. So I've really found that the simple approach that everyone understands what their, what their role is and you know, what that encompasses is, is the, the, the best way that I've found. Simplicity and clarity of expectations. Uh, and that dovetails very neatly with business. Uh, so, so, Mark, when we think about the, the need to be resilient, it's a word you hear all the time, especially now, these days. Uh, and it means so many different things to so many different people. So, in, in your lens, from your lens, what, what does being resilient mean in terms of being a leader in business today? And why does it matter? Yeah, I think you had a good point there, and as well, and, and it is we do have resilience, you know, in, in every facets of our life, Dave. You know, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether you're you're juggling your, your job or you've got a mother juggling children. Um, you know, going through the last few years with the pandemic, I think a lot of people have really had to draw on a form of resilience they probably never knew they had. They, they faced something in their lives for the first time, but they've really had to dig deep. I mean, we had to dig deep like this every single day in operations because you're, you're tested every part of you physically, mentally. And it's really, you know, been able to get up each day and, and, and really sort of keep rolling on. And I think at the higher end of business, especially in that real senior leadership sphere and C-suite and up, up towards your senior executives, um, they're under big pressure, big pressure financially, um, you know, with massive expectations and shareholders and stakeholders expecting, you know, miracles every single day. And 
sometimes you've really got to draw on, on that, that, you know, that ability to just keep pushing through. And I think it's a word that gets thrown around a lot, of course, resilience. Um, I think it's something years ago you never really, you didn't really hear it very often, and, but now it's become very, very popular. And, and it really is, um, I think it's a real meaning of finding out who you are. And, and I found out that myself overseas in operations where you, you really discover what sort of person you are and where you can really draw on to keep cool in those situations, to keep calm and draw on all that strength to really, you know, get through your objectives. And I think it correlates so well into uh, the corporate world and the professional world. And I think a lot of great leaders, they, they don't really realise what you know resilience they actually draw on every single day of their lives to keep it going you know with all that all that pressure and expectation and giant workforces and it's a it's a you know a very very high pressure situation yeah sometimes resilience just gets baked into your dna and and like you said you're not even consciously aware of of the fact that you are being resilient but in your day-to-day you're coaching leaders and and would-be leaders in, in terms of resilience and other matters so let me ask you this maybe share a tip with the audience here if you wouldn't mind what are some of the things that you're recommending to your clients in terms of how they can be better performers under stressful situations, i.e. to demonstrate that resilience? I think a, a lot of the, and I'll probably re- reverse engineer it a little bit here, I think a lot of the, the leaders I work with that actually have issues, maybe, maybe they've got an issue with the business. Um, and I think a, a lot of what I find is that they may have a, an external pressure coming in that actually affects their, you know, their, their day-to-day operations. Maybe they're, they're thinking it's their staff are the problem. Um, sometimes I actually find out it can be the person directly and it can be sometimes, and I find this a lot, and like I said, they may have an, ex, an external problem where they're going through a, a bad marriage breakdown, they've got custody battles, you know, deaths in families, and this affects directly the business itself and, and you know, it affects that person and it just filters down through the whole workforce. And I think a big tip, you know, really is you've just got to really, as a leader, you've got to understand you've got this big responsibility, um, you know, hanging over your people. And it's your it's your job to actually be that be that inspiration for those people as well. You've got to really inspire them. You've got to be understanding. You've got to be a person who's flexible. And I think the modern leader is different to what it was 20 years ago. It's really sort of morphed into a different theatre now, um, different generation of kids coming through that would expect a lot. They're... they're a lot more, I think, advanced in their thought process than what I was when I was in my twenties to what they are now. They're not afraid to speak up. They're not afraid to leave a position if they're not happy now. And years ago, if you had a job, you stayed with that job, but now the kids are happy just to, to take off and go somewhere else. So I think as a leader, you've really got to be adaptive, um, you know, and, and really, uh, you know, in, in, encourage that in the business as well. So there's some of the tips I can take that I, that I give out and to try and remain uh, cool under pressure to take it to you know sometimes take a breath as well to what you're doing and you know instead of actually making very very quick decisions that can be wrong take a moment to actually think am I making the right one and try and take the emotion actually out of that decision making process yeah you said something that that resonates there in, in that response mark when you talk about how um, sometimes your your people may have some underpinning circumstances that you may not be aware of, like they're dealing with a death in the family, they're going through a divorce, caring for an elderly relative, something like that, that may have impacted their performance. And it's so easy for someone to just see the missed deadline or someone showing up late and make assumptions. Um, but you're, you're encouraging the, the deeper dive. So let me just dovetail that into... Uh, I know you're a believer that leadership is really about the heart and the mind. Maybe you can speak to that just a little bit more. Yeah, I, th- I think you've got to you've got to love what you do. And I think with a lot of leaders, they really get to a point where they maybe forget a little bit where they've come from. Work, you know, they forget how hard they worked years ago, all that sacrifice to get where they actually are today. And and I find a lot of them are like that. Um, it can be a little bit of a light bulb moment for them when you actually ask them. You know, do you do you still love what you do? Do you still enjoy coming to work on a Monday morning? Or are you thinking about Friday afternoon on Monday? And, you know, that whole path of, of which can happen to, to all of us, you come a little bit complacent um, and, you know, a little bit comfortable in, in that role. But uh, I think as a, a leader, especially in those real high performers, that they're in a real critical, you know, business infrastructure there, and they've got to keep that, that momentum going all the time. So I, I think it's, it's vital to never lose sight um, of, of who we are and. And even those little things like treating everybody the same, whether it's the, the person meeting you at reception or your, your fellow you know, directors on the board, 
Um, you've got to, you know, really understand that everyone's, it's, it's like a giant wheel, it's a giant machine. And I learned this in the military that everyone's got their, their, their piece. Everyone's got their, their, you know, their sort of, um, their moment in the sun. And it's like a giant cog. And if you lose a, a cog off that wheel, then the, the thing doesn't work as effectively. So you've got to have everybody, you know, working in the same sort of um, momentum as well. So it's, I think it's very important though, that leaders really understand that, you know, where they've come from and, and, and just still really, like I said, like what they do. Because if you don't love or like what you do, then what, what's the point? <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, Mark, for any folks who are watching and listening, if they want to learn how to get in contact with you, work with you, what's the best way for them to connect? Yeah, not, nice and simple. I'm, I'm quite active on LinkedIn as well. Um, my, my website, it's just markashbyconsulting.com and my uh, email to the, to the um, my personal email to the website is uh, mark at markashbyconsulting.com. Yeah, and, and just... Um, and I'm, I'm yeah, available all the time. And, and, and just to be clear for the audience, you are working with clients around the globe, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Uh, I've got a very big history with, uh, with the, the, like I said, the US military and, and clients in the US and uh, also in um, uh, Europe as well. So absolutely international. Yeah, and that's great because this is an international audience. We've got listeners in 74 countries right now. So be sure to reach out to Mark. Mark, you mentioned something about being a high performer, and I want to just explore that a little more deeply as you connect the dots between the definition in the military and the definition in business. What does it mean to be an elite high performer? I think it's a term, uh, David, years ago that I didn't really understand. I, I, was, I was hearing it when I was over in the Middle East, especially in the early 2000s, around about 2004 and 2005. And I heard it for the first time over there. I really remember it. And I was very curious, what is what is a high performer? What constitutes a high performer? And I always attribute it to maybe uh, sporting teams and and maybe the elite people in sporting teams. Uh, you, you might have somebody like Michael Jordan in basketball, and everyone may see him as a high performer. But I soon, I soon learned to realise that there are a small group of people um, they're, they're people that they never sit still or idle and they want to get the best out of themselves, the best out of their people around them. I found a lot of the ones I've worked with, they're more than happy to share their, their wisdom and their secrets because they're so focused on, on moving forward with that momentum that, that they're not really uh, holding it in too tight about what they do. I find the, the ones more on that comfortability area in the, in the executive level will be more inclined to keep it to themselves about their that, you know, their own success stories because they're comfortable being there where the high performers, they want to keep on advancing and they, they, they just don't want to be, you know, good. They want to be great. It's a bit of a cliche, but that's how I see them, that they want to be different. They're not everyone's cup of tea sometimes. They can be a, a little bit, uh, you know, maybe the words prickly at times, they're the real high performers. Um, but the ones that I've had the pleasure of working alongside and, and for have been, yeah, great, great role models and great examples to me about getting the, the really the best out of yourself and the best out of the people around you as, as well. Yeah, Mark, do you think it's possible to take an average performer and make them elite, or is it something that's e either you have it or you don't? I, I tr yeah, it, it's a very good question, isn't it? And, and I'm, I'm not the expert that can say that, but from my own opinion, I, I think a lot of those people, like a lot of maybe elite sportsmen, that they're born with it. They really are born with it, and they can just enhance it so easy. And they, if they make a big mistake, they don't panic. They just uh, attack it from a different angle until they're successful. Uh, you know, they, they maybe will lose everything, but they don't give up. They've got a dream and they keep going and, until they actually get it right. And uh, can, can it be, be taught, I think, to a certain degree? But I think things like that as well, it, it really comes, it's, it's, you know, it really comes natural. It's like those sporting champions where they make it look easy. It's, it's a, sort, of, sort of a similar correlation, I think. Yeah, you mentioned that sometimes high performers can be a little bit prickly and to continue the, uh, the analogy of the sports, uh, I like to analogize in football, the wide receiver position, for example, a lot of great talented receivers historically, but there's been a number of them that have been, uh, we'll call them problem children, off the field. So there's the balancing act between the high performance and, and the bad locker room component. How, how as a leader do you then reconcile this high performance and some of the negative components that come with that so that they're you know, actually playing well with others along the team? Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I had a, uh, a gentleman a while ago. Um, he's a CEO of a company back in Sydney. And very similar things. He got me in to, to get rid of a lot of the toxic problems in his company. I, I soon worked out that he was actually the problem. And, and that was through meetings with his staff and, and management. Eventually, as you, as you know yourself, when, once you're in an organisation long enough, the truth eventually filters out. People start to talk as they get more comfortable with you. and. I feel it's something that I've always been quite good at is getting 
the best out of people and, and gaining their trust. So when I discovered it was him, um, I actually got him out of that office environment. Um, him and I went and had lunch together away from there and and really, um, you know, gave him the honest approach a, a, about, you know, why the business was suffering and, and that he really had to change his ways. He had this incredible organisation, this amazing workforce that worked for him. They loved working, you know, what they were doing, but they weren't happy in the workplace. And I go back to what I was saying, I told him, I said, they're going to work Monday morning and all they're thinking about is, is Friday afternoon. And I said, you know, do you want your people coming here loving what they do and then you'll get more out of them? Or do you want them continuing as they are and you're going to keep losing staff, they're going to keep hemorrhaging and, and eventually it will fall over. And I said, you've got this in the palm of your hand and the ability to actually really do something amazing here. And, he, and I worked in the end, I found out he was actually going through a really bad divorce with a custody battle and he was taking out a lot of that out on his staff and the business. And, and it was a good story then because he really sort of listened and, and I think saw the errors of his own ways, like, like we all have to do. And, uh, and, and he, he's thriving now. So it's, um, it, it can be done, of course. Yeah, and when I was working on what was uh, my first book and, and talking with some Harvard researchers around toxic employees, um, I, I came to understand a, a not so fun fact that oftentimes the toxic employees are in fact more productive than your average employee. So this is a real issue that folks are dealing with with high performers day to day. Uh, Mark, we're going to have to take a quick break here so you don't go anywhere. You folks watching and listening at home, don't go anywhere either. We'll be right back on Behind the Numbers after we take this quick break. a Wawa Club? Is it the crispy bacon on the turkey BLT? The endless layers of flavor of the buffalo chicken salad? Or is it a secret handshake? Nah. At Wawa, there's a club for everyone. Find yours today. We ride for those who died. The Police Unity Tour and RVN Television is bringing to you a show called On Your Honor, Straight Talk. And I'm your host, Patrick Monturi. I am a retired police chief from Florham Park, New Jersey and I am also retired from the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C. I am currently, for the last 27 years, the CEO and founder of the Police Unity Tour. And this show will bring to you straight talk about law enforcement, the actions and heroism that is provided to you, the citizens of the United States, as well as their actions in falling in the line of duty as we could see some of the stories that surround that. Again, please watch us on RVN Television and be safe, take care. And welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and we're talking leadership with Mark Ashby of Mark Ashby Consulting. Mark, welcome back. Good conversation in the first segment. I want to kick off the second segment here just by, by calling out some activity that you're involved with. I know that you're a writer. Uh, you do some work for uh, a magazine. Why don't you share that with the audience and, and tell them where they can find some of these musings? Yeah, I write a, a monthly column in the leadership sphere for a, a fantastic uh, magazine called Industry Expert. Uh, the magazine's based out of um, Victoria, or out of Melbourne in Australia. Um, uh, the, the lady that, that runs the magazine, Mary Henderson, she's a fantastic lady. Gave me this great opportunity to give me a real open book, you know, where I can really write about the, the things that I that I love and what's current with with leadership. Um, my last my last article was actually on. Uh, it coincided with with sort of International Women's Day, so I wrote about female leaders and the transition that they've had from, you know, like I suppose the early 70s and 80s, and and through the uh, the big you know ASX companies and 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 where leadership for females is you know progressing into the future. So that was it. it's it's quite an exciting um, exciting times. Good stuff, Mark. In, in preparing for our conversation today, I, I I did research, of course, and I spent some time on your website, and I saw something interesting where you had mentioned that every company has three types of employees. Can you share with our audience what those types are and how they interact in the business world? Yeah, I worked this out uh, years ago when I was doing a lot of uh, coaching in the, in the media. Um, I was coaching a lot of their, their journalists and foreign correspondents um, and doing a lot of boardroom talks, generally from around about sort of 10 to 14 people at a time. A lot of personalities, uh, of course, with the media, it's, it's, it's quite a lot of, um, you know, egos in there. But I really realised that the, with the percentages, and I did a bit of writing this down to, to see how it would go over a couple of years, and it was, it was quite interesting results. And I found that your your first type was always your your quiet type. 
um, in the meetings, though, they were the ones that sit there, take it all in, don't say much at all. And you could go around and do your introductions to a meeting, they'll give you the real basics and they just want to move on, not comfortable at all. You're going to get your, your big part of the cohort, your, your middle group that are all, I suppose, mates in the workplace. They all talk a lot. They're all quite loud. Um, and then you get, without a doubt, every meeting, you're going to get your couple of alphas, your couple of alpha men or women. I've seen it in both, both uh, aspects that really are going to do you know, the majority of the talking. And I find that that then flows out, of course, into the workplace. And my favourite aspect is to always be cornering the quiet ones outside of the uh, the meeting you know we have a break and maybe go for a coffee in their coffee room i'd always corner the, the quiet ones and try and find out more about them and who they are and once you get their trust i find the quiet ones are the ones you'll find out all, inf- all the information about the company how it works yeah, very, very interesting dynamic and it's just I suppose, I suppose human nature some people are really comfortable in that meeting environment it's like being on camera and other people later really struggle with it but i found the quiet ones they sit back and they really absorb and they take everything in. But when they do talk, they've got volumes to actually, uh, you know, to talk about. Yeah, and that's uh, what I've been reading and hearing too from uh, the research that I do and, and leaders that I talk to as well. So what's your counsel then, Mark, for how to get the most out of these quiet uh, employees? Because like you said, they're, they're the ones that, that tend to know more, but how do you get that from them? I mean, my, my personal trick is I, I get them one-on-one. I call them one-on-one and I won't let them away from me until I until they can actually open up a little bit. Um, in that cohort where it's it's uh, lots of people, maybe 10 to 15 people, they're not gonna say much and they you really can't force them to, they just get too nervous. But you get them away from there. Like I said, whether it's just going for a coffee with them and if you have that people for a few days, you'll slowly break them down. And sometimes it's really interesting to see them actually turn around by the end of that, you know, three or four days, even sometimes five days they really come out of their shell and they start really uh, talking in the group. And it's quite it's quite a funny dynamic to see the, the other loud ones witness the, the quiet ones sort of come of age and start really giving their own out. Because like I said, I've found quite often that they're the ones with the best information because they sit back and they, and they, and they listen. It's even like in boardroom meetings, I've found that a lot with a lot of directors that they'll sit back and they'll just say nothing. They'll sit back and just listen. And they're the ones that I want to talk to. You know, it's not an easy process. You've got to be a little bit uh, understanding with them but you've got to really, you know, get their trust and, and really let them know you're not going to just um, throw them you know, to the wolves, so to speak. You're going to look after them. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. Mark, for folks watching and listening, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Yeah, best way is just through my, um, my email address to, to the business. It's uh, mark at markashbyconsulting.com. Great. So, Mark, I was just told by my producer that we went a little bit long in that first segment before we took a commercial break. So the second segment is a little bit more abbreviated to make the show the cohesive 30 minutes that it is, uh, which means I'm down to the short strokes now suddenly here. So we only have a few minutes to go in the program. But, but I wanted to ask you at least one more thing in just a couple of minutes here that we have left. And I want to talk about limiting beliefs. I think you call them limiting paradigms. Um, many leaders that come on this program talk about having to overcome their specific limiting beliefs. What's been your experience in working with leaders? What, what's the common thread and, and how do they overcome them? Well, I think the, the common thread is, is just, and I've, I, I touched on it before briefly, I think that it's just becoming comfortable. Um, I, I think that you've got to have that sort of belief as a leader, that, of course, you have to believe in what you're doing, you have to believe in your people and, and all those cliche words, you know, about getting the best out of your people. But I think once you become you become comfortable as a leader, you've really sort of plateaued. And it's about you then as an individual having a look at yourself and, and how you can, you know, do things better the next day. And that that encompasses everything that what you do in that, in that business, whether you're in the military, uh, because without your staff, you know, you, you don't have an organisation. And uh, if you have that, that staff on side, and I've seen this with amazing leaders over in the military, over in the Middle East, especially a couple of generals that I've worked with, I've seen their, their men and women that would do anything for them. They would follow them, literally follow them you know, into a burning building because they were so inspirational, looked after the people so well, and, and they're the ones that you want to, you know, they're the ones you want to work for. It's, it's so simple. Look after them and they'll do anything for you. Yeah, that really resonates. Uh, I, I talk about that a lot, that uh, the leaders that led with empathy in, in my career, uh, they were the ones I'd walk through fire for. Uh, if they, you know, they understood what my circumstances were and gave me the freedom and the latitude and like I said, the empathy component. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them to show them that it would, that their trust and belief was worth it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's the ones that are, a friend of mine, he actually said a great thing to me. He said, 
the leaders that you'll you'll love in the future, the ones that you maybe haven't seen for 10 years and you'll be walking down the street and you'll see that person and rather than crossing the street to avoid them, you'll actually embrace that person and you know catch up with them for a, a chat or a coffee, whatever it is, versus the other one that you, you just don't want to associate with. And I think that's a really good indicator of, of how well that leader's done. Yeah, and for the audience watching and listening, if you have a leader that uh, you've really appreciated that's led with empathy and you would walk through fire for them, if you haven't talked to them in uh, some time, definitely reach out to them. I know they'd appreciate hearing from you. Mark, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I want to thank you so much for being on this program and sharing your thoughts with us today. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure, David. Thanks very much for having me. Our pleasure here as well. And once again, I want to thank you, the audience, for watching and listening to this program. We can't do it without you. Please crush that subscribe button so you stay in touch with all that we're up to. We drop an episode pretty much every week. Uh, thank you to the folks in the production room back there for making this show go as smoothly as it always does. Again, my name is Dave Bookbinder. I'm the author of the new ROI series. It's uh, two best-selling books about the value that people contribute to a business enterprise. You can check them out and connect with me at newroi.com. That's all we have for today, folks. We'll see you next time on Behind the Numbers. Take care.